We have a very special guest with us tonight. That is uh, the director of Betzedem USA and also one of the founders of If Not Now, When. If you could please join me in welcoming Simone Zimmerman to the stage. Hi. Um, before we open it up to everybody, Simone, I just wanted to ask you a few questions. Um, and that is, you grew up in a traditional Jewish American community. Um, what was your journey like to becoming active in the Israel-Palestine space? Um, hi, everyone. I don't know about the rest of you, but I need to take a deep breath after that. So. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, it's good to be here with all of you. Um, so as I said, my name is Simone Zimmerman. Um, that play brought up a lot of different feelings for me. Um, and what I, what I wanted to share um, about the journey that brought me here tonight is um, going back uh, to my grandfather's. Um, my mom's father grew up in Warsaw, Poland. Um, and moved to the Free State Palestine in the 1930s. Um, he's the only one, uh, his mother is the only one of her 12 siblings who got out before the war. Uh, and on the other side of my family, my father's father uh, was an American uh, from Atlanta, Georgia, who fought in World War II. And uh, I grew up in LA in a very comfortable, vibrant Jewish community in LA, uh, and, and was raised with a, a real sense of, of pride for the community that I grew up in and the incredible success uh, and comfort and safety uh, that was you know, a story, the story of, of our community. And I was also taught that um, the lessons that I was supposed to take from the, the history of the generation before me was, was to be proud of, of the community that I was part of and, and also to know that those achievements and that safety and that security and that prosperity um, was only ours to thank ourselves for. Um, and, and including in that was the creation of the State of Israel. Um, and, and I say only ours to, to thank because I, I, including in that mean, and especially no thanks to anybody else uh, for that. Um, I decided to go to university at, at UC Berkeley in part because I wanted to be an Israel advocate. I wanted to go and um, as one of the ways to defend that, um, you know, to defend my community and defend that legacy was to go and teach people the truth about what was happening in Israel. Um, and uh, I found out very quickly when I got to UC Berkeley that, that what I considered to be the truth was, was, was barely even half of the story. Um, uh, settlements, occupation, war crimes, None of those words were even part of my lexicon when it came to Israel. Um, and I heard Palestinian students telling their stories in, in campus debates. And, and, and not only were they things that I maybe thought I disagreed with, they were just so outside of my, my worldview that I couldn't even integrate them with the narrative that I knew about m me and how I got there to campus. Um, and... Um, after my freshman year of college, I, in this kind of moment of confusion of hearing all these stories and not knowing what to do with them, I, I went um, to, to Israel for the summer. Um, and I found myself in a neighborhood in East Jerusalem uh, called Sheikh Jarrah. And um, this was in the summer of 2010. Uh, and I found myself, uh, I'd been connected to a, a friend of a friend who was, who was volunteering uh, at the time with an organization that um, was working to, uh, against like housing demolitions in East Jerusalem and home evictions. And uh, for the first time in my life, I knowingly, knowingly walked into occupied territory. Um, for those of you who have been to Jerusalem, um, coming from uh, Tal Piot, 
uh, farther west in the city. Um, I made my way toward the center of town and you know, for the first time, usually when I came from where I was staying, I would kind of take a left up the hill and for the first time I walked over the hill uh, and down the hill towards uh, Sheikh Jarrah. And, um, and, and I, I mention that because it's just, it's that easy in places like this to just miss the worlds that are happening right in your backyard. And I think here, as Amer like in, in the US, we could say the same thing. You take a left, take a right, and you're missing um, incredible poverty, incredible dispossession down the street. Um, but so for the first time, I, I, I walked down into this neighborhood, and I, and I met uh, a Palestinian family who um, had recently been evicted from their home. And um, a group of uh, Jewish Israeli settlers had kind of used dubious legal means to uh, claim ownership of this home uh, before 1948, very relevant uh, in the context of this play. Um, actually, a Jewish family claiming previous ownership of the home to uh, evict the Palestinian family from their home. And uh, suddenly, this family was homeless, and their house was now draped in Israeli flags. And uh, I stood there uh, meeting this family, and, and the, the father kind of turned to me uh, after getting off of a very friendly phone call laughing in Hebrew. I had also never met, um, I'd never met, you know, uh, I hadn't really met a Palestinian in my life before, and here he was speaking in Hebrew, laughing on the phone with his Israeli friend, um, and he pointed up to the house uh, across the street, and he said to me, um, you see that flag? That flag represents so much power to me. That flag could crush me in an instant. Um, now for me, that flag represented so much fragility and vulnerability and, and, um, and pride. And suddenly, for the first time in my life, that paradigm was totally flipped on its head. Um, and I think that that moment brought home for me in a really powerful way um, the, the total paradigm shift that happened in my life, understanding that um, I grew up with this very, this very deep ingrained victimhood narrative and actually that there was actually someone else and an entire people who um, had become the victims um, yeah. in, this, in this story. And I'll just close up real quickly one, with one final anecdote, which is that in uh, leaving that neighborhood and trying to make sense of it, I reached out uh, to a family friend who was a journalist, and I asked him, what, what should I do about what I just saw in this neighborhood? I, I can't even reconcile it with um, everything I know about this place. Like, tell me, tell me how to understand what I saw. And you know, he looked at me, and he shook his head, and he said, um, I drive past Sheikh Jarrah every day on my way to work, and I try not to look. <laughs> I try not to look. Um, and I, you know, I think that that trying not to look, that refusal to look, that, that denialism is, is um, something that oft, too often characterizes, yeah. I would say, how um, Jewish Americans and, and Jewish Israelis are, are often engaging with the, the, the suffering and the dispossession that is happening um, in our backyards or overseas. Um, and, and, that, and that refusal to look is something that, I, like for me as, um, as a young person seeking to understand and trying to make sense of, of this world has, has really uh, motivated me in my activism to, to demand uh, that people in my community look at what's happening. You know, Simone, in this, in this show, we see a Jewish Israeli woman going to the States, coming back, and she says she's learned new things and, and learned another side of the history, much like the story you told. Um, and yet her, let's say, activism, a moment of being active um, and wanting to make the situation better, uh, she puts this guy's life um, on the line. How do you reconcile that? Yeah. So we totally didn't plan this. I'm really <laughs> glad that you said the word activism because actually for me watching this play, um, I felt just an extreme discomfort watching Talia um, yeah. as an ac as an activist. I found it really, really painful um, to watch her because um, 
because I saw how much she really wanted to, to make a difference and to make it right and to bring justice. Yeah. And I, I felt how, like both in the, in the context of this person's life, like she can't undo what's been done, but it, I, I think what's really so like jarring about this play is that it, it, in a very, very personal way, makes you confront the enormity of the politics of it. Um, yeah, so I, 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 for me, in some ways, watching the play, I just I wanted to invite her to become an activist, <laughs> um, and and, I, and and like to me, what is it, what does that actually mean to be an activist? I think it it um, it means to be collectively and publicly in action with people, um, in and to um, you know make it so that the system can't function the way it's supposed to. Um, and, and part of the story is of, a, uh, of two people who get caught in a system that is, is working quite well for itself, mm -hmm. while, and, and we're seeing the, dam the damage that it's doing to them. Um, but, but yeah, when I, like when I think back on um, you know, even just the story I told about going to East Jerusalem for my first time, like, that story would have been meaningless of me coming you know, to yep. just, you know, I don't know, share my condolences with this family. That, that in and of itself is not a, a meaningful action, but what was meaningful was being in public there with a group of Jewish activists who, um, you know, are, are putting themselves, uh, I would say, like, in the field, making it harder for the army and for the state to, to do their work. It, it's, they're still doing it pretty well, but I think that the, the people who are, um, that, the activists who are like refusing to make it easy for the system to function are the, are the people who do give me some sense of um, like hope about the possibility of something to change, and I and I think that is the only thing that will change things. Amazing! I was just going to ask you, what are, what's a moment that gives you hope? Um, <coughs> What's your reaction when you see a play like this? And um, knowing that it was intended for a, an Israeli and Palestinian audience. Was this play shown in Israel? This, so this play was, I'll just give back on to everyone and also, um, this, this play was shown in Israel only eight times. Um, it was produced at the Almidan Theater in Haifa. Um, the Almidan Theater was the only um, major state-supported, Israeli state-supported, Arab-speaking theater. Mm -hmm. And this play, The Return, in Hebrew, originally named Oved Shabbat, Sabbath Worker, um, was uh, produced in Hebrew. They made the decision to produce the show in Hebrew in order to bring Palestinians and Jews together. Um, unfortunately, this, coupled with one other play, was deemed inappropriate for Israeli audiences by the cultural minister, Mir Vegev, and the theater was shut down. Um, so the play only got eight, eight perform performances. The playwrights described sitting in the audience and having their hands held on both sides by Jews and Palestinians. Um, and also describe Palestinian, young Palestinians being very angry at this play because it portrays a Palestinian who is conforming and allowing himself to not live within his identity. And um, many Palestinian activists, the younger generation said, that's the old generation, that's not who we are anymore. Um, Knowing that we're showing this in an audience that's not in it, you know, uh, not made up of Israelis and Palestinians, what uh, what do you see in that? Yeah, well, I mean, that's also totally my reaction to this character, Samer. I mean, I think I just was watching him thinking he doesn't that I know that that is a a story that is real and true for a lot of people, and it doesn't it doesn't speak to the to the activists and the young Palestinians that I know. <coughs> I think when you ask about like what, what gives me some sort of, of hope for the future, I think one of them is um, that I think that especially in, like in a place like the US right now, that there, um, there is a growing space for much more honest conversations about what's mm -hmm. actually happening over there. Yeah. Um, and I think 
I think not being willing to engage in the in the full picture and in its messiness and and, and the fullness of, of what's really happening. Um, I think there's a growing space for those hard conversations here and that gives me hope that eventually there will be um, uh, <coughs> the possibility for, for real change. And, and the other thing that gives me hope is, um, is the people that I know who are, who are not doing um, what he did. And, and, and one person that comes to mind for me is, um, I feel very fortunate in the last year or so um, I got to make a friend who lives in Gaza. Um, and I feel even more lucky that this friend who lives in Gaza, that I've gotten to meet her twice in the last year. Mm -hmm. um, now that's incredibly unusual. Um, uh, Gaza, for those who don't know, uh, about two million people live there. Um, some call it you know, the world's largest open air prison. Um, the two million people Palestinians who live in Gaza um, can't leave except in extreme humanitarian circumstances and other special occasions, um, including uh, this friend of mine who got to go out, she got a permit for work. Uh, mm -hmm. An embassy invited her to a meeting and she got the opportunity to go out. Um, now while I in the last year or so you know, have found myself on uh, you know, at least three different continents and many more countries uh, than that. And I have often booked a flight, you know, uh, I booked, you know, my trip here like a week ago. Uh, I didn't really have to think very hard about if I was gonna be allowed to come all the way from New York over here, which is farther than, you know, it would take to get from Tel Aviv to Gaza. Um, I can just do that. That freedom of movement, that ability to decide I want to go on vacation, I want to go to work, I want to go visit my family and friends, that's a, that's a luxury and a basic right that I take for granted. Um, now, this friend of mine in Gaza, if she wants to, to, to leave, um, she's 31 years old, she made it out for the first time in her life a year ago, um, and she had to get this special permit, and it was a many months long process. Um, and she didn't even know until you know, the week that she got to go that she actually was allowed to go. Um, she couldn't take a rolling suitcase out with her. Israel doesn't allow rolling suitcases to go out of the security checkpoint. She couldn't take makeup with her. They also don't allow makeup to go out. Um, so all these basic things that you know, I, can s I don't even think about. Mm. Um, she got to leave um, and she went also into historic Palestine, into Israel for the first time in her life. And the first time I met her, we had dinner in Jaffa. And I asked her, where's your family from? And she said, my family's from Jaffa. Mm. Um, and here I was, uh, at the time I was living in Jaffa, and, and here she was, uh, 31 years old, the first time in her life visiting this place that her family was from. Um, yeah. we, 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 you know, we got to talking, I got to hear about her life, in Gaza, people, you know, living with, uh, you know, limited drinking water and electricity and, and all the, the basic things that we consider to be essential components for, for just basic living life. Um, people in Gaza are denied those, those rights. I mean, a lot of their infrastructure has been destroyed and, um, you know, bombings by Israel and, and the closure and the amount that people can get in and out really severely has depressed the economy. Um, but, but I'm telling all of this actually because this person, um, despite everything um, that she has experienced, she, has, she refuses to leave. And mm. she's, and not only that, while I was sitting there with her, she's saying, I miss Gaza, I want to get home to Gaza and be with my family. Um, and, you know, I think, and, we, and, you know, I could tell dozens of stories of, you know, just normal young people, activists, and not young people, um, living across the region, living in uh, you know families in Khan Al Ahmar who refused to be um, refused to allow Israel to demolish their homes and move them out of their village, um, all across um, you know Israel and occupied territories, there are stories of people who are staying steadfast in their homes and refusing to leave. And I think you know when I think about you know young people in Gaza who are insisting on doing all these things and innovating and working and having hope for the future, I don't know why I have the luxury to give up one day. <coughs> um, I want to take, yeah, two, um, over here, and if you might just share your name with us. 
Why is this issue uh, endless? Why why can it not seem to cease? You you want to take? We should that have one? a long drink for that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, you know, my answer will be the one that the play says, um, which is fear. Um, that the Talia in the fourth scene, after everything and after all this. Journey stands there and says, um, you know, for a moment I felt it in my stomach that for this one place, for this one little refuge in the world, you'd have to not, and he says, not exist. Mm -hmm. And there's, that's a fear um, that I've heard people say. Um, members of my family say that. Um, and the fear that should Palestinians return, will it still be Israel? Um, and I think, for me at least, it's really important to call that out and say that's really fear-driven. Um, and for me, what a play like this does is spark the imagination and say, but is your fear based on reality? Um, my 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 answer, my personal answer would be no. But um, I mean, I think that the fear is the thing that's halting. A season bit. What do you? What would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, I think I do think there's like a fear <coughs> line. I think part yeah. of what you're saying is totally true. Um, fear and trauma, and you know yeah. the. The, the strong narrative of like the Holocaust happening and then the Nakba happening and people living with two sets of traumas on top of each other and many other traumas um, in that place. And, and I think there's also like a geopolitical reason why the situation is continuing and yep. it includes US interests in the Middle East and the weapons industry and Christian evangelicals and <laughs> lots of other people who have a stake uh, in the situation continuing and in, and in profiting off of um, the, the deepening of the occupation and of Israeli control over the entire region. Um, so, um, <laughs> I get, I, you get to have the political answer, I get to have the emotional answer. <laughs> um, yes, over there. And if you might share your name with us. My name is Andy. A lot Hi of what Andy. Summer uh, had to endure reminded me of what American black people uh, had to live through in the uh, Jim Crow South, and to some extent today, of course, but um, but I, I was still, that was a long time ago, and I'm shocked, is it true that there are actually anti-Mexican laws in Israel? So uh, I'll answer this, um, and I'm told, I, I, I have my cue that this is our, we are at time, but I'll answer that, which is that um, this, particular uh, story is based on a case, just on a headline, um, and it's a legal apparatus uh, which is known as rape by deception. Rape by deception exists in Israel, in the United Kingdom, in the US, South Africa. Um, rape by deception, like the name, is when somebody um, has sex with somebody uh, with the deceiving factor in there. Uh, in the United Kingdom, there was somebody who had sex uh, and had not mentioned that they had actually transitioned from one gender into another. Um, and that other, their sexual partner found out and they sued them. And there was a court case that ensued. In Israel, there was a case uh, now 10 years ago where a Palestinian man did not disclose that he was Palestinian, uh, had sex with a Jewish woman, 
and this Jewish woman found out he was Palestinian, sued him, went to court, he went to jail. Um, what that, so, so we, there's no, there are Palestinians and Jews who do have relationships, um, but what this legal uh, story tells us, if, if, if laws tell stories, is that the legal system believes that there is something inherently different between these two peoples, mm -hmm. and that if there is, uh, if that is not revealed, that is a crime. Um, because we are uh, short on time, I want to just uh, say two things. Um, one, which is that dialogues on Israel-Palestine can be very uncomfortable. <laughs> and very difficult. Um, they spark not only intellectual responses, but emotional and spiritual ones. Uh, there are so many spaces for us to be in our echo chambers and hear the same thing regurgitated to us over and over and over again. Um, so I would really like to thank you all for the courage of showing up and taking in some truths that may be very difficult to listen to. Um, I'm really inspired and in awe, and, and that's why I invited Simone to share a bit of her story with you, her story of coming to this, um, because I think that uh, sharing this from a place of vulnerability can only create uh, empathetic ties to people who we might not normally have empathy towards. Yeah. Very brief. Yes. You're thanking us, but we should really thank you. Yeah. Uh -oh. Because yeah. you gave us the opportunity. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. I just want to say one last thing, which is as you came in, uh, some of you have asked, what's happening to Israeli stage? Um, why is it closing? Why is this the last production? And what's next? I won't share with you exactly what's next yet, but I do want to say why we're closing. Um, and I'll tell it with a story that I heard from my friend Malia Lazu, um, who's a community organizer in Boston, and uh, it's actually a Ghanaian folktale about a giraffe and an elephant. Um, the giraffe and the elephant were friends for many years, and they always hung out by the lake together. Um, and one day the giraffe asked the elephant, hey, would you like to come over for dinner? And the elephant said, sure, that'd be great. The giraffe went home, cleaned up his house, put some peanuts in a bowl, and <laughs> was waiting for his <laughs> elephant friend to come over. As the elephant was approaching the giraffe's home, he knocked on the door. The giraffe said, come in. The elephant saw that the door could not fit him in. And the giraffe said, come in. And as he was pushing through the door, the giraffe said, stop, stop. You're going to break apart my house. As the founder <laughs> of a company called Israeli Stage, uh, we have come to a realization that we have built, we may have built a home that was great for giraffes, <laughs> but was not always a great home for elephants. Um, and so what we're working on next is a home that's going to be one where we can awaken the courage to celebrate the full humanity of giraffes and elephants together. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank Simone and all of you for showing up and for being a part of this. <laughs>